So um, now we are turning to quite a different subject. We're going to hear from Simon Tegg about uh, puberty blocker use in New Zealand um, and whether this is a case of over medicalisation or unmet need. Um, Simon's a software engineer with an interest in evidence based medicine. He founded the Fully Informed Group in 2020 to scrutinise the use of puberty blockers for paediatric sex tray modification in New Zealand. Welcome, Simon. We're really keen to hear about your research. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, uh, and I'm assuming you can hear me right now. Um, so, yes, I'll be talking about the sort of usage of puberty blockers in New Zealand. Um, fully Informed is a group. Uh, of uh, medical professionals, policy people, uh, legal experts, and and parents, uh, and so we there's a bit of a play on words. Is that fully informed is is the right uh, health consumers in New Zealand have the right to be fully informed about the treatments uh, that they are being um, that are being suggested, and it is also that we sort of take a very kind of detailed look. Uh, so what I what I do is is um, I make a lot of, um, I'll use this acronym OIA, which is the Official Information Act. I make a lot of um, OIA requests to uh, different government agencies uh, to try and find out more detail about what the situation here in New Zealand is. Um, and so one of those, one of those uh, agencies is Pharmac, which is the National um, Drug Purchasing Agency for the New Zealand Health System. And they provide um, good detail um, on uh, on different drugs and like how prevalent they are in, in usage. Uh, so we're going to drive like right into sort of one of the main uh, way, one of the main charts. Um, and this is this is uh, from from some of that research. So this is a chart that plots um, the the usage of puberty blockers. For, um, for for a particular age group for 12 to 17 in New Zealand um, from sort of the early sort of 2006 right through to quite recently. Um, and it's compared with um, the, the, the usage in um, England and Wales. So the England and Wales figures come from the NHS. Um, there are, we do have sort of some earlier figures from the NHS, um, but it's just it's easier just to show this one from from a particular data source. This is from their recent consultation on the use of use of puberty blockers in um, in that jurisdiction. Uh, so obviously you can see that has in, sort of increased quite rapidly, and we're now looking at about um, just over 400 um, 12 to 17 year olds being treated with puberty blockers, and a roughly the same number. I think it's 378 in England and Wales. Uh, and so there's a particular reason why this age group um, is, is, I've chosen this age group um, to present uh, because it has other indications. Puberty blockers are used, the same, the same drug is used for uh, prostate cancer and endometriosis in adults. And then it's also used for short stature and precocious puberty in, in, uh, in young people. So that, but normally that finishes up by age 12 um, and so the use of this group this group here it will be very like the vast majority of it will be for uh, gender dysphoria um, so obviously there's you know those those figures are sort of roughly comparable for um, for England and Wales and obviously England and Wales has a much larger population of adolescents so if we took put that out by rate the next chart you can see this is now by rate so per head of uh, this is now per 100,000. So New Zealand figures is roughly 110 per 100,000 in the most recent uh, time period, uh, whereas England and Wales is about uh, 10 per 100,000. So that works out to be um, one way of thinking about it is 0.1% of the adolescents in New Zealand are being treated with uh, this drug, uh, which is really sort of um, like one, it's sort of averaged across high schools, that sort of one uh one person in a large high school or if it's although there's going to be regional variation so there may be you know there may be high schools with two or three um, being treated sort of on average uh, and so now there's this obviously there's this question there's a bunch of questions that fall out of this chart um, and those questions will structure the rest of the talk um, and so does this um i'll just show another slide just to sort of show 
another chart. And so now this is um, this is back to um, treatment prevalence, absolute numbers. And this orange dash line here is the um, the usage in nine to eleven year olds. So nine to eleven is still in an age group where um, it may be being used for short stature or for precocious puberty. And so you can see that that has increased as well. And that had a sort of prior to the sort of really emergence of its usage for gender dysphoria in, this, in the 2000s, it had a usage of about 40 and now it's increased to, um, and this is, a, this is a separate quest to about 100 and 160 um, in 2020. So some of that, that has also risen. And so some, I think that some of this, this rise is also that it's increased for precocious puberty and short stature. Um, but some of that rise is very likely to be also usage for gender dysphoria. So really the sort of total usage for gender dysphoria is probably slightly higher than this red line. Uh, and I think what may have happened is its usage for gender dysphoria has sort of cross legitimized its usage for these other indications, which aren't, which are, you know, they, it's not entirely clear that that's, that's, um, that's a good situation for those as well, but it's, but that's not going to be the topic of this. Of this presentation so there's some obvious questions here um so first question is why is it so much higher in new zealand uh, what are the consequences and is this um is this over medicalization or unmet need because you might approach this question um you might approach this chart you've if this is the very first time you've seen it and you might say well this dot down here this this usage in in the uk that that might represent sort of an appropriate usage and this excess here is over medicalization. It's a bit more complicated than that. Um, and the and the clinicians themselves in New Zealand would say that what they're doing is is that uh, the UK has sort of re unduly restricted the usage of puberty blockers. And actually, in New Zealand, we have you know it's more appropriate is to be treating zero point one percent. Now, there's a couple of, I don't agree with that position, but it's sort of worth um, thinking through like how that. How that gets rationalized or, or the structure of that argument so we'll look at that as well um so okay so why is it so much higher uh oh yeah there's some there's some other secu secondary questions like how did i calculate this and what are the prospects and those might come up in the question time it's just there isn't enough space to do that so yeah why is it so much higher um so there's really sort of one thing i'm going to focus on mainly here which is the top one is that it's in new zealand it's it's delivered through the primary care system and there's less bottlenecks um we touched on a bit of jan touched on a bit of this and 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 b uh, so the policy context um there's very lax oversight and i'm not going to go into much too detail much higher. There. Um, um, that so there's really sort of one thing i'm going to focus on mainly here which is the top one is that yeah. it's in new zealand that's it's delivered through the primary care system and there's less yeah um and then there's also the um also social and yeah there's also new zealand has some differences between overseas about how uh that sort of oversight might function in a broader context so less bottlenecks and let's look at the primary care delivery okay so i've made this i've made this sketch here of um of how it works and then you, I haven't got a, I haven't got a picture for this, but you might compare this to, uh, to the Tavistock situation if you're familiar with that. I might describe that as well. And we'll come, we'll come. There's a few parts to this diagram, and we'll come back to it as the presentation proceeds. So I've sort of sketched this out in terms of uh, on the vertical axis, um, like a more um, affirming, or what I'm going to describe as more scientific approach. And at the bottom, I'm going to have a more uh, scientific uh, approach. Uh, and so there's a so the, there's there's clinics and youth clinics um, and gypsies, which are GPs with a special interest. As a GP, you can train to do um, to specialize somewhat. And so there's there's GPs who specialize in in gender medicine, uh, and also sexual health clinics are really sort of the core initial people who would have set this up um, in the 20, 2010s, early 2010s. Um, and there's a sort of a pathway here of a referral to a psychologist or not, maybe, maybe a referral directly to an endocrinologist. We'll talk about that a little bit. The endocrinologist will do uh, the first injection of puberty blockers. And then generally it'll go back to the sort of arrow down in the, in the, the corner arrow there I've got in the top right. 
uh, the the following injections after the first will be managed in the primary care system, managed in the local clinics. So this is based. This this sort of diagram is based on conversations with a variety of uh, medical professionals, so psychologists, psychiatrists, GPs, um, secondhand through in, to endocrinologists and other people who have an interest in the health system. Um, there's also this. There's also a bit of a pathway towards. Um, a non-medical pathway, but it's very chancy. I've sort of started, I've sketched that out at the bottom here, um, where you may get a therapist who who is more skeptical about gender identity, and they may um, continue with with a sort of psychosocial approach. But it's sort of it's quite um, a fraught situation generally. So the first thing we're going to talk about is this sort of um, this axis along the the top, the sort of more scientific and more scientific, and and I think um, this is this was sort of mentioned here. So this this is an article from uh, the Guardian um, very recently, and it describes this the what happened, what's happening with the, the situation in NHS. So they've decided to restrict uh, puberty blockers to medical trials, and they're going to set up a new sort of gender identity set of services to replace the Tavistock. Uh, so that is, um, and you the, see from the highlighted text that that is um, that there's disagreement around. There's the sort of there's this. It's very hard to get to a middle ground or a consensus um, around uh, from these two perspectives. And so I thought that was a sort of quite timely article, and it does sort of speak to the situation uh, in New Zealand as well. So I've described this as, you know, there's this really this sort of other other speakers have talked on about this, that there's this, uh, there's these ideological uh, divide here. Um, and I put this um, kind of this background here of geological layers because underneath underneath the dispute about um, is it is it unmet need or is it uh, over medicalization is this is this ideological dispute. And so the bottom layer of this geology really is is about epistemology and uncertainty. The next layer up is is around it, the etiology of gender related stress. Why do people feel uh, feel that they need uh, medical intervention to change their bodies? And then there's a sort of a notion of harm. So there's different perspectives on what is what is harmful. So we'll just dive into this, and then I'll bring it back to some of some applications or some um, some other aspects of what's going on in New Zealand. So there's this, there's these two perspectives here, um, and so if you're if you're familiar with evidence-based medicine or the scientific approach to things, that there'll be um, that you can probably guess how I've arranged this, that there'll be this um, this hierarchy. So increasing, so it's really sort of increasing confidence as we go up the hierarchy. So a, a systematic evidence review is sort of regarded as the the the, the procedure that pro that produces the most. Um, high confidence knowledge, um, and then uh, there might be randomized control trials, and there might be um, studies, observational studies, of different uh, measuring different outcomes. At the bottom of that hierarchy is the subject self-report. So it's in the scientific approach um, does not really. I mean, it might be a useful starting point, but the but a subject self-report, or a, or in this case, a child self-report about their own exp their own experience, that's not regarded as um, a source of of truth. It might be it might be um, notable. Or it might sort of start um, where things are, but it doesn't tell you much. Next, the, also what what the scientific approach is clinical experience, because in the history of medical um, medical scandals, clinical it's always sort of relies on the on a clinician thinking that they had the right way the, the right approach. Um, uh, based on just their experience, but their experience can be biased in various ways, uh, such as they they don't do follow up, or they see a particular presentation at their clinic, or they've invested their reputation, or sometimes their um, their business interests in in a particular treatment. So it tends to be we tend to sort of include it but discount it in the in the scientific approach now over on the right I've, i sort of present the scientific, what i'm calling the scientific approach and in this approach the subject or self-report is the top and there was a very um uh, just the other day there's an article from jennifer block in the boston globe and she interviews uh, jason rafferty who's the uh the 
the one of the architects in the US of their of their gender affirming care approach. And he talks about this explicitly that that if somebody says that they're X, that's that's how they orient the whole treatment program around that assumption. So I don't think I'm being unfair when I when I put this at the very top. And they also they also highly value clinical experience. And then if they do other studies, it tends to be quite questionable studies like data mining. So in New Zealand, we have the Counting Ourselves um, survey, which is really just a large internet um, sample survey. It's not representative. Um, and then I've put in sort of faded text here, the systematic review. So they do, there are sort of systematic reviews, but on the, on the scientific side, they don't really talk about them very much, or they don't really refer to them. And if they do refer to them, it's, um, it's, it, it does it isn't reflected very well in, in their guidelines. So there's quite different, uh, in fact, very opposite approaches. Uh, there's also how how they how you treat uncertainty is sort of it's, it's been a strong interest of mine. So in this this over on the left hand side we have um, the a piece this report from the clinical advisory network of sex and gender, and they discuss um, how like one thing that's uncertain is the effect of puberty blockers on the developing brain, uh, and so there's animal studies and a lot of those animal studies are highly suggestive or one in the animal study there's there's uh, permanent effects on uh, cognitive function if you block puberty. Um, now, but that, that those studies aren't, you know, because it's animal studies and maybe a case study, those studies aren't strong enough to say with certainty that this will happen in, in adolescence as well. Uh, but the treatment of that is that the uncertain, if there's something as uncertain, it's underlying risk could be high or it could be low. So if it's uncertain, we still have to deal with it. It's still something that a health consumer would would want to expect to be told about. However, on the scientific side, we there's a the, the usual approach is to collapse something that's highly uncertain with no with a, the category of no risk. So there's no mention in any uh, guidelines or consent forms about the risk of um, on brain development. Uh, and so it's and there's another piece here from uh, this is another guideline. This is for cross sex hormones where they actually have a they actually have this headline. No, incre no increased risk or unknown. So they collapse those two together when a, when a more scientific approach would be to say, oh, it's unknown risk. Uh, and that is that means it could be higher, it could be low. And then a second thing would be, well, this is what we know to be low risk. You would split those out. Uh, next thing is, is there's, a, there's these two sort of theories around how um, two broad theories around how um, why do people feel this distress uh, and this is really sort of covered um, in the CAS this is covered in the CAS report uh, from um, the CAS independent review in, in the UK uh, and over on the scientific so I, I call this side the, the constructed self and that we construct ourselves out of our experiences and our impulses but on the scientific side the, there's, this, there's a concept of the authentic self that's somewhere underneath this, there is a there is a male essence in a in a female body or vice versa and so there's this is sort of collo colloquially known as born in the wrong body and previous other other presenters have talked about wpath and um, wpath authors actually go as far as saying a gendered soul um, in the literature that they published on this uh, then there's also another sort of thing that this this cons this question of etiology this question of why do people feel this distress is um, is increasingly even sort of regarded as as uh, transphobic to even kind of bring up, um, and instead the rhetoric has shifted to uh, the autonomy rather than rather than discussion why it would. And so it doesn't. So it's incurious to to this. And other other speakers have touched on that as well. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of how this plays out. So talk about, so on the previous slide, um, is this, there's this abuse and other, other speakers have touched, like uh, Nahui has touched on this, um, and Joe and Alistair have touched on this initially as well, um, that abuse. So what I'm not going to do is I'm not suggesting that everybody who has gender-related gender distress has experienced abuse, but it does come up. It comes up in the literature fairly regularly, and it comes up in the stories of detransitioners as well around why they decided to transition. So I'll give you an example how this plays out. Um, this here is, is uh, Dr. Jamie Veal. He, he is the, um, 
very recent, until very recently, the president of PATHA, the local group in New Zealand, and also the WPATH secretary. Uh, and he's written, he's sort of been involved in a variety of guidelines, including the guidelines that Jan has analyzed. Uh, and he's a psychology PhD. Non, he's not a he's not a clinical psychologist. He's the um, the non clinical sort at Waikato University. And this was his. So he's sort of had this initially in his sort of academic career. He's had this interest in like this question of like what are the what, potentially what are the causes of gender what he calls gender variant identities. Uh, and in his PhD thesis, he actually finds this. That there is this relationship, a like possible relationship between abuse. Uh, this is in this, in this case a mute, emotional abuse and having a gender variant identity. Uh, since that time, he hasn't really focused on that aspect at all. He's focused on the sort of reverse causality that 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 uh, gender variant people are the target of abuse. So gender minority stress theory. But in his original in his original work. As a graduate student, he did actually find this relationship. So this was a, this was a internet. This was a large study of maybe two thousand um, people, um, and then put a statistical model, crunched the numbers on what those, what the, what that statistical model suggested would be the relationships. So that was, you know, that was twenty eleven, and so now we'll skip forward um, into. Uh, oh yeah, he also cites actually. This is another important point. This is sort of. Um, touches on Nahui's point here um, is that he cites this study by Devore. Devore is also another WPATH author um, from 1994, Transsexual Disassociation and Child Abuse. So, so this was interviews with 45 uh, female to male transsexuals who, and the majority of them who reported severe severe child abuse. And so there's this, this quote here from Devore um, about um, the the abused person fearing disassociated from their own body and and seeking another um, seeking another body uh, pot potentially as a sort of maladaptive solution to that abuse perhaps trying to escape that abuse or abuser uh, so he's very aware of this literature this is cited in his in his PhD uh, and so we skip forward um, to twenty twenty the. Um, three or 2022 and now this is the draft uh, this is the primary care guidelines for hormone therapy so not for puberty blockers but for cross-sex hormones and uh, Jamie Veal is one of the co-authors of these draft guidelines they've now been they've now been finalized as well the lead author is Dr Rona Carroll uh, and so there's this quote here from uh, this I'll bring it up actually this um, Yeah, so there's so now he says there's no evidence that sexual abuse causes gender incongruence. Okay, so that's quite misleading given that he found something and found a relationship between emotional abuse and uh, and gender variant in his own PhD thesis. And then if your parent patient has a child, uh, then there's these very sort of tortured sentences. Um, it'll be important. It describes it as a complex interweave with gender incongruence and. Uh, if they have a sort of sexual abuse history. Uh, but then in the author's experience, many patients can clearly differentiate between their symptoms of trauma and feelings of gender incongruence. So it, it's like, well, really, can they? Can they really um, clearly distinguish? The next thing that sort of contradicts that, and then it says, as part of the informed consent process, check your patient understands gender-affirming hormone treatment is not a treatment for sexual abuse trauma. So they're putting that sentence in. Obviously, what's happening is that people are arriving at the clinics having been sexually abused and seeking hormone treatment as a solution for that otherwise why why would they have that sentence so this is the draft and this does not actually make it into the final copy of the of these these guidelines so potentially it was just too awkward of to highlight this especially given um, veal's background and actually finding a relationship um, 10 years earlier Uh, and then there's this notion, so there's a notion of harm. And so there's, there's two sides really are trying, they have a notion of harm and that is to harm somebody is to challenge their identity. And the scientific approach is sort of the harm is really to, um, is really to the body. Uh, yeah, so that's, that, those are sort of the deep, the deeper sort of ideological disputes around this. Um, and that kind of covers off 
this this side of things here so there really there is i put this bit here incoherent muddle is in the middle uh and that uh that a politician a little, like often people think that there's a compromise that you can have a compromise um and i think alistair and joe touched on this a bit as well but really if you had what we what you end up is sort of a is that you end up with an incoherent you you've just you're just not applying scientific principles consistently so this is that that sort of part of it is that that's where a lot of um, gps are i think a lot of the of like the bulk of gps are in this sort of position and they will um, refer to uh they will feel uncertain about what is happening about whether the child actually needs these treatments but they uh, are they aren't very empowered to do much about that and so they will just refer to a psychologist and they'll refer to the psychologist to kind of cover that off to make sure all the, the i's are dotted and the t's are crossed uh, and then if that psychologist gives an, a proper assessment they, the, the gp can say well okay well i did what i was supposed to do um yeah and that's that's sort of the amount of support that they have uh and I'll, I'll contrast okay so i'll talk a little bit about this um these youth clinics and this is sort of really where the contrast with the tavistock um comes in so in the tavistock uh, is a sort of quite a large institution. It had uh, it had a head of safeguarding. It had a board of governors. The whole book um, I've got it right here actually. The whole book, um, you know, time to think by Hannah Barnes is sort of details how how uh, the clinicians undermined the head of safeguarding, and she successfully sued them eventually, uh, and undermined David Bell, the, one of the governors. But they did actually have those um, sort of checks and balances on what they were doing. Uh, and then New Zealand case it's, it's done in youth clinics or sexual health clinics. And so I'll give you, this is just the bout of displays of one of these clinics, right? So it doesn't immediately, the question is, do these people have a head of safeguarding? No. Do these people have a, a board that is strongly looking at the situation in this youth clinic? No, of course not. I mean, this is just quite a, like a, a small scale uh, clinic in, in, um, in Christchurch and they present this house in sort of oh we're being kind it's it's sort of we're in with the kids and that's that's about the extent of it so this is this is so Bagshaw this is one of the the clinics here um and this she is she's been prominent in this area she's a dame uh, in New Zealand um and that she says that She's interviewed, and when she when she gets interviewed, it's also quite interesting because you'll reveal some things about how it's really working out. And so this this clinic has a hundred gender diverse patients, and about sixty five are on puberty blockers. So that sort of tells you. I mean, sixty five. That's probably in Ireland. There's probably like 10, 10 to 20, 20, 20 at the very most. Probably more like ten patients in total in the total area of Ireland are being treated. But in New Zealand, at one clinic. 65 on puberty blockers uh and yeah, yeah there's 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 sort of there's also 80 percent so in her view in her view this is just her sort of reckoning that 80 percent will then go on to um cross sex hormones uh that, that's a lower figure than is reported elsewhere and i think that what might be happening is there's a sort of broader application means that that less go through whereas in the tavistock um much more restricted application means that they're sort of more certain that those people are that it's appropriate. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how that might work out is that the um, that you get this that these these people will then refer directly to the endocrinologist. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this other um, other aspect about sort of it's option. It seems to be optional to refer to a psychologist. So in the next slide, we have some. Uh, these are responses from some of the OIR requests. Uh, this is a document on the on the left. This is from the Ministry of Health in 2020, and they really sort of say um, they talk about whether some children some require children to get a private assessment by a psychologist before starting puberty blockers or hormone treatment this approach can become problematic. So, uh, and then they kind of go on to say, it is important to consider potential misalignment with indigenous and cross-cultural understanding. So they kind of imply here that you might be being a bit cross, maybe not, maybe racist, or maybe a bit cross-culturally insensitive if you refer to a psychologist. So it's optional, should be, we should make it optional. Um, and a potential solution is, 
is to put in guidelines making it clear that it's actually optional to go um, to go to the psychologist. Uh, and then on the, the right hand side is that well, what happens if you do go to the psychologist? This is from Te Whatu, all the New Zealand's national um, the sort of operational side of New Zealand's national health system, um, and they say that. Um, it's not really about assessing or exploring the background, the reasons. Um, the psychologist does not assess, on the way they put it, the psychologist does not assess gender. This is self determined by the patient. Uh, so there's this policy. I won't talk much about that other than the largely up to lunch. I mean, it's an unapproved, it's, a, it's approved medication, but not for, um, not for, uh, for this usage. Um, a little bit about the social institutional context and that um, New Zealand is, there are some difficulties with being a small country the the public servants and the journalists are very young if you're if you get to your sort of late 20s you often head off overseas head off to Australia or the UK to to further your career so that there's high turnover um, often you have re very recent graduates and in, in these positions either in journalism or in or in the public service and there's sort of a sense, there's sort of a large section of the population has sort of got, got attached to this idea of kindness, um, but it's not really kind of the policy realities and not really um, at the forefront of that of that situation. So I've got this sort of this other bit here from from uh, I thought this was quite good that that um, this is this is uh, Thomas Cranmer. He sort of brought up. He also does writes a lot of official information requests and. He thought, yeah, one piece comes out that New Zealand, in terms of media pluralism, New Zealand ranks last in terms of media pluralism, um, with with last equal with Turkey and Romania. Uh, and so there's this the on the right hand side is my tally of how many balanced articles there's been about this issue or been about the overseas issue. These are the major New Zealand uh, media companies. Uh, stuff has never has never covered it in any um, in any balanced way. Uh, the Herald, which is NZME, did publish an editorial by Jan. I don't think TVNZ has ever covered it. Uh, Radio New Zealand has had one decent article. Uh, News Hub have had a have had two. Listener has had two like pretty good articles, uh, but they seem to have a sort of rate rate of about one per year as their limit. They won't do it any more than that. So there's been no no real coverage of the Tavistock um, situation. Uh, or the or the high rate in New Zealand, even though I've I've emailed a, a number of journalists around this issue. So that's sort of the summary of like why that that situation in New Zealand. Um, uh, yeah, there's just there's very little oversight and there's very little engagement from those institutions or from the media. Um, so now the consequences, I will also this, we don't have a lot of time to do the consequences in depth, um, but there's, uh, there's the sort of ABC, there's the, there's the effects of on fertility, sexual function, bone health doesn't really recover, it recovers partially under cross sex hormones, but not fully, uh, particularly for males, and that's in a systematic review. And then I've talked a little bit about cognitive function as well is that it's uncertain, but potentially high risk situation where there could be there could be um, like con quite consequential impacts on co cognitive function uh, from the animal studies. A uh, little bit about this is that there's this, there's this technique, um, there's this fallacy you might be familiar with, the Mott and Bailey that they describe um, so reversible. There's two interpretations of what reversible mean. Often it's described as safe and fully reversible, or the Ministry of Health did describe it this way. Um, and that means in the sort of layperson interpretation is that you will that you'll meet all the developmental, you'll come off puberty blockers and you'll go on to meet your developmental milestones. The other meaning is that there's the the, the direct effects of the of the blockers on the endocrine system will reverse. Uh, so that and that is sort of the, the what they now say, right? So there's this Mott and Bailey fallacy is you make you make a sort of broad statement that is interpreted in a particular way, then when you're challenged about that statement, whether it is actually reversible, you fall back to saying, oh, no, I didn't mean it in that sense. I only meant it in the sense that 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 the endogenous sex hormones will restart. And so that's what we see playing out now. Uh, that the, 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 the rhetoric has shifted around what, what actually reversible means. Uh, and there's this... Other years, so I've brought up this, and so Bagshaw in twenty twenty was saying it was reversible in terms of bone health, and that's that's not accurate. Um, it was highly misleading. 
uh, and I'll just this is the this is I'll skip over this bit. This is this is sort of this this is this, there are some there are there are some sort of glimmers of hope in that senior clinical advisors have come in and they've removed this um, highly misleading statement about it being fully reversible. Uh, and the last sort of bit before I get into summing up is the sort of impacts on impacts on uh, fertility and sexual function, uh, and that is that. Um, so one thing we are confident about is that if you're treated with puberty blockers at 10 or stage two of puberty, which is like roughly 11 or 12 years old, it's the, the very sort of first signs of puberty, and then you follow that up with cross sex hormones at say age 16, it's very very likely that you will be sterilized. So there's some there's a lot of this is, is sort of low confidence or that or highly uncertain because the they don't do follow up studies. Uh, but in this case, we actually do have something that we're quite confident about. So that, what that means is that if we have about 400, just over 400 being being treated a year, that means that roughly 100 to 150 are starting puberty blockers uh, each year. Now, if we can make some assumptions, uh, so say in a low estimate that 20% of them are starting at 10 of stage 2, and that 75% continue to cross sex hormones, that comes out at 15 sterilized per year. In the higher estimate, um, say a third are starting at 10 of stage 2, and 90% continue, that means 45 are being sterilized per year. So this is quite significant. I mean, people say, oh, what, 0.1%. Um, that's not, um, they must be very careful, but considering the impacts, this isn't very careful at all. This is quite, um, this is quite cowboy, really. Uh, and so this, I'll sum up now. So there's the over-medicalization or unmet needs. And so there's really... Um, you have to kind of go back to first principles you know is is somebody if it isn't if it is unmet need then then people must be some people must be born in the wrong body but i don't think that there's evidence really evidence to suggest that um we do have recent studies that are showing a higher discontinuation rate from cross sex hormones and from from puberty blockers uh this and there's sort of bagshaw here really kind of sums it up that she she thinks in one of these interviews, she thinks that you actually could be doing psychosocial first. It's just very hard to do. So she's not doing it. It's very expensive and it's time consuming. It might be worth doing, but it's hard. So she's not doing it. She also brings up the threat of suicide uh, for that. And and the, yeah, these are those are some of the discontinuation studies. The sort of rates are now reporting around between sort of six and thirty percent discontinuation rates. This is only after three or four or five years, um, you're getting high discontinuation rates. So the foundations of this analysis that it's that it's a unmet need um, is very shaky when you consider those rates. And also you consider that some of the Dutch researchers are now saying that puberty blockers themselves may may lock the person into a, into um, that pathway. Um, so if you think about this this argument, it's like really if it is an unmet need, then we can compare to other countries. That means that in the UK there must be um, there must be all these suicides happening, or that we're in other countries. It's similar, similar also in Finland and Sweden and the Netherlands uh, that with these low rates, they must be that must be producing a high rate of of suicides who don't get access to the treatment. So we can do those sorts of comparisons. We can also look back in the 1990s and the 2010s to see if there really was this the suicide rate um, from this population and that's that doesn't come through at all so that's that's my argument um it is it is a huge scandal um and if uh this is thanks for allowing me this opportunity to present these figures i'll put out another a paper accompanying paper for this um with all the references um once we kind of finish this up um and I've got this. So one thing that we are doing is you can you can sponsor a copy of this book um, to go to a bunch of um, decision makers in New Zealand. Um, so they'll get a book and a letter, accompanying letter, to sort of highlight this and and the difference between um, New Zealand and uh, and England and Wales. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Simon. This um, appreciation coming through in the chat for uh, the work you're doing on a more evidence-based approach to this. Um, I have a question. Um, do you know if the Office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor uh, has got this on the work program at all? 
Yeah, so to, uh, I think we get a new science advisor every five years, um, and I'm not sure actually. Is it, it has been Julia Gerard? Julia Gerard yes. has been email, emailed about this. It might be. I'm not sure when her term ends, um, but she tends to. I mean, a lot of people just sort of tend to pass it on to somebody else. The there is there are chief science advisors in other in other ministries. Uh, and so the Ministry of Health has a chief, chief science advisor as well, and they have a sort of network of science advisors. And we do know that the that the acting chief science advisor at the Ministry of Health is actually very aware of this and is now putting out an evidence brief on puberty blockers. So there is some, uh, some, some signs that there is sort of action there, but I don't think it will necessarily come from the prime minister's one. They'll probably... It may that may change in the new government. Um, they might get asked to look at it, but it, it's th at this point it's coming from the Ministry of Health's Chief Science Advisor. Right. Um, thanks. And then this so uh, a question has come through: How did you get involved in this? And having us amateurs help when the professionals have lost the plot? Sorry, what was the last part of that question? Uh, how can us amateurs help when the professionals have lost the plot? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am an amateur. Uh, this is just, uh, I, I got involved with, with this because I don't have a particular connection. Um, I do have, I do have trans identified people in my, in my wider family, but not my immediate family. Um, uh, I do have younger relatives. So I am who are like roughly at puberty. Uh, so I am concerned that that they would um, that this would be presented as an option being medicalized. Um, uh, but I think it's and I but I, what I really I guess I really is that a lot of people involved in this are parents and I'm not a parent and and they are restricted in what they can say and what they can say publicly because they have to keep this relationship up. So I saw I saw that the situation and thought well I'm I have these skills I have a background in research and in policy um that i should i be given the situation with parents and their restriction on being able to speak up the needs people like me who don't necessarily have a direct connection um and how can people get involved it is a it is there's really just a lot of um kind of letter writing um to people uh and i think it does add up this, this sort of stuff um yeah it's a letter writing to medical associations and to um, mps and ministry of health it does sort of add up in the end. Thanks, Simon. Um, and there was a note that went up quite early in your talk, um, and you may or may not be able to um, shed any light on this. Um, interestingly, the Rainbow Youth Guidelines for Mental Health Services are to not inquire about underlining causes and also not mm -hmm. to use measurement tools of dysphoria. Are you able to comment mm -hmm. at all on that? Yeah, well, it sort of it speaks to sort of the situation um, in New Zealand. This is sort of Jan touched on this as well. Um, compared to overseas, like it's really sort of there's the sort of middle ground where you do this assessment, um, and then, then there's rhetoric around like, oh, we're going to do a proper assessment, and that that can give um, other stakeholders sort of more confidence that that um, that the, the treatment is appropriate. Uh, but that in New Zealand has sort of basically been blown away, and uh, now it's like fully captured into into oh no that would be stigmatizing. Uh, so the whole the whole kind of Overton window has shifted into oh you couldn't do any assessment at all um, because it's not that would be contradict autonomy and it would then it would be stigmatizing. So it's kind of um, even people from the sort of from the UK, where there is rhetoric around, oh no, it's properly assessed. It's properly assessed at the Tavistock, um, and it's properly assessed by um, these these people that are involved. It's just not that, not that situation in New Zealand at all, really. Well, um, Simon, thank you so much for joining us today, um, for the work you're doing, and for presenting it so clearly to us. Um, mm -hmm. And I look forward to hearing more about fully informed.